architecture and architecture and is currently the principal of D-Land Studio, located in Brooklyn, New York, an award-winning multidisciplinary firm that includes landscape architects, architects, urban designers, sculptors, scientists. Um, Suzanne is also adjunct professor of design at Harvard Graduate School of Design in New York. Among other honors, Susanna is the recipient of grants from the Graham Foundation, the James Marsden Fitch Foundation, and the New York uh, State Council of the Arts. Uh, please join me in introducing Susanna Drake. Thank you. Thanks, I have to get, get my technology set. It's kind of amazing how many things you have to be attached to to make things work. Um, so, hi, I'm Susanna Drake, and um, as, as you so nicely said, I'm the principal of D-Land Studio. Um, I'm an architect and a landscape architect, and I, I want to thank you for, for having me here, Mark. I really appreciate um, bringing me to, uh, um, to Syracuse. Um, uh, one, Mark and I see each other occasionally because we're both on the Van Allen Institute board, and it's very nice to get together in the city and also learn more about what your school in, or your program in, in, um, in New York City is doing as well. Um, so I am going to talk about um, infrastructure as it relates to landscape architecture um, and architecture uh, in, well, it, with three projects in New York. Um, and my lecture is called Seating Ecology in Public Space and Urban Infrastructure, Elastic Landscape. So, oops, and I know I'm going to mess this up. So the, um, the, the urban industrial waterfront was really designed for exchange. And I show um, four cities, Boston, New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, with different edge configurations um, that really were designed um, with a morphology that was uh, really um, intended to uh, facilitate trade. But as um, there was a move to containerized shipping, um, there, there was a, a, a different uh, a different type of, of need in relation to cities. There, we needed to have large amounts of, um, oops, sorry, I didn't advance the, I'm advancing one slide and not the other. Uh, I'd like to be coordinated. <laughs> Too many things. Um, so, so with the move to containerized shipping, there was a, a new need for large amounts of storage space. Um, this space, uh, space for gantry cranes and access for trucks and for trains. So I can do this at the same time, there we go. So in New York City, what this meant was that there was a move away from a lot of the port spaces in New York um, over to the larger um, uh, spaces um, that related to both rail and highway infrastructure systems in, um, in New Jersey, and a little, bit, a little bit still in Staten Island. I can do this. Okay. So um, if just looking at San Francisco for a moment, you can see how the space of exchange is now available for a different kind of function. And a lot of these spaces are now being rethought um, for uh, park space and, and other uses. So, but ecological systems exist at a very broad, uh, broad scale in time and in space. There are complex patterns that may not really be readily apparent at the human scale. Um, but we think of, of, uh, we think of New York as a large, complex system. Um, and it is, but there's also a sort of compartmentalization of the landscape within that urban system um, that may need to be rethought as the economics of environmental impacts um, come into focus. So, Robert Moses really understood the value of creating green space in the city and had this incredible impact on New York, adding parks and playgrounds and housing. But his proposed verdant uh, parkways um, often displayed a very different reality. So, but it is possible to combine um, infrastructure with sustainable parkland. And we have one of the best, sorry, we have one of the best examples um, in Hudson River, or in, sorry, along the Hudson River in Riverside Park. Um, sorry, constructed, this is a little bit too much coordination for me. Um, constructed between 1875 and 1910, the um, 191 acres stretch from 72nd Street to 125th Street along the Hudson River, um, and it covered the Hudson River Rail um, that connected New York City with Albany, and actually the rail line that brought me here today. Um, but it's, it's interesting to look at the historic um, uh, wetland maps 
from uh, 1776 and see how those patterns now relate to, to um, potential inundation patterns projected um, with, with some of the uh, sea level uh, rise and climate change projections because there is really a relationship between those patterns. And if we think about um, what we've done to the industrial edge, the hard edges actually take, um, take the energy of waves and leave nowhere for water to go as you end up with these, or as you um, have these inundation situations. So what we're looking at um, is the potential to create um, a, new, uh, a new ecological edge. So if you look at the shape of a historic ecological edge, there's sort of a broader uh, profile. And within that broader profile, you have uh, the extreme high tide, the mean high tide, and the mean sea level happening in a broader uh, uh, expanse of space and with uh, a, a quite varied habitat. So what we want to do is start to morph um, these urban systems, you know, here just in this case with just a walkway and a, a, a harder edge, um, with these ecological edges. So now I'm going to talk about these three projects that, um, that we're working on right now. This is the Gowanus Canal Sponge Park. Um, we, we, uh, we started this project by thinking about how a, uh, a wetland actually acts like a sponge. Um, and when you're going into a public presentation, it's often useful to come up with a metaphor like that because um, if I went in and proposed to, to people in Carroll Gardens and Cobble Hill that I was going to be putting wetlands in their backyard, they would have freaked out and said, go home now. So, but, but coming up with the idea of the sponge park made it a bit more appealing. Of course, people still, still think that we want to put sponges in the streets, but that's, that's another story. So we, we, um, New York City has this issue that we have this combined sewer system, and I think probably a lot of you are studying this now um, because it's an, an issue that's, that's kind of uh, problematic for a lot of American cities where um, in, uh, in a dry weather situation, the, uh, the sewage, the sanitary sewage is basically going directly into a sewage treatment plant. But what happens is when you have wet weather, the storm drains and the, um, the combined sewage actually come together and the overflows go into our, our waterways. Now, this happens at the Gowanus <coughs> Canal. The Gowanus Canal can be a very, very beautiful water body, um, but it, and it has this kind of deteriorating um, edge, but it is really quite, quite a lovely post-industrial landscape. Um, but there are a number of places where there are uses that are, are not waterfront uses. I think which one I'm doing. Okay, this one. Um, and places where um, the community is actually uh, using the waterfront. This is the Gowanus Canal dredgers. It's a boat club that's housed inside this uh, shipping container. And they come down and they use, the, uh, uh, use this as their boat launch. Oops, I'm going back. Okay, so so in, a, um, in a storm situation, um, we end up with a lot of uh, surface water runoff that collects with it uh, a huge amount of detritus on its way down to, to the canal. I mean, you can see what happens at the street ends with the oil and the residues from the, um, from the automobile traffic in the neighborhood um, collecting and also bringing with it all of, this, uh, all of this garbage. So we approached this situation, um, or the, the design of the, the area, and I think in a kind of different way than, than a lot of, um, uh, that really had been done before um, because in an urban setting, because we thought about the watershed, and we thought about the sewer shed, and we thought about what the inputs were to, that, to those systems, and calculated the amount of water that we were going to need to absorb within a 15-year storm. And then um, basically figured out what our need was. Instead of saying, okay, we're going to go in and we're going to make a lot of street swales and we're going to do a lot of green roofs and, and you know, we're going to try to just make this better, we said, this is what we need. We need 11 acres of permeable ground in order to take all the water for this area. And then, and then we said, okay, well, we're not, we probably aren't going to be able to get 11 acres within the actual area that we're working with, so we'll see how much we can get. But part of our, our total catchment area included um, a lot of backyards in Park Slope and also um, part of Prospect Park. 
So we looked at the location of the sewer outfalls um, and also the storm outfalls and then where the storm drains were and we mapped all of those issues or those things. Um, and then we proposed that this um, sponge park, this new system of parks and open spaces would actually um, be used to redirect the storm water and absorb, absorb um, some of the surface water so that we'd have fewer CSOs. So we, we, as part of the analysis, we, we really wanted to break it into a, a, a really an urban design problem. And so, but an urban design problem that also included landscape issues or that integrated the landscape and the architecture and the urban design. So we looked at the hydrology, the ecology, the land use, and the cultural preservation, and then thought about how those relate to the CSOs and the street runoff. But we're really trying to integrate these things, seeing how the ecology relates to the contaminated water and makes poor habitat, how land use, um, you know, number, a lot of the land is privately owned. How do we make it into a public space or how do we make more publicly accessible spaces? Um, and then um, how do we really preserve some of the historic elements in the area that are falling apart? And really starting to pull all these things together, you know, you can see there's a tremendous amount of solid waste, trash, contaminants, there are VOCs, there are, you know, there's sulfur, there's lead, there's, you know, you name it in this soil. It's an incredible sort of um, garbage dump of a post-industrial landscape. So we started to think about how um, the sponge park would start to um, basically create more connections between different historic sites. Um, there's an old stone, the old stone house, the Revolutionary War Monument, preservation of that beautiful power plant that I showed you with all the graffiti on it. Um, how we might um, think about um, creating new program areas with dog runs, community centers, um, and improved habitat. And then really how the plantings um, would really improve the hydrology and improve the, um, the, uh, the ecology of the, the soils and the, the air and the water. So we looked at some examples of a really smart uh, landscape architect in, uh, in Portland, and you've probably all seen this image. And you've probably also all seen this next image, but this landscape architect Robert, or Kevin Robert Ferry did a really good job, and so I always want to give him great credit for coming up with something that has really inspired a lot of, a lot of our landscape architects, but I think also um, helped city administrators sort of understand that it's possible to do these kinds of things. And then we, we mapped the locations where these, these more traditional kinds of stormwater um, systems could be placed. So we looked at where the parking spaces were and where the hydrants were, and we actually went out and physically you know, drew it all and figured out what our opportunities were. Um, and then we also looked at uh, the opportunity for redirecting the stormwater from these upland drains um, into a series of, um, of uh, stormwater irrigation, or basically a series of channels that would bring um, the water down to a stormwater irrigation esplanade. So in an average rainfall, the, the filtration swales will take most of the water. But then in a heavy rainfall, a rainfall more of the water is actually directed down to this edge, uh, edge area. So uh, we looked at different strategies for remediation, um, sidewalk stormwater uh, uh, filtration swales, floating remediation swales, um, uh, street storm wa stormwater filtration swales and remediation wetlands um, all in different areas and then also um, calibrated the plantings for different levels of inundation and we tried to use plantings that would um, were parks department approved plantings things that they were comfortable using that were on their their lists um, and we also cross-referenced those uh, plants with um, their capacity to process PCBs and to process heavy metals so this is, um, this is a, uh, a community that can take more water. And then these are the plants that can be you know, wet all the time. So within the, the Gowanus area, I mentioned earlier on that, that really complicated chart that, um, that there is a lot of privately owned land. So when you're designing a space that you're trying to make into a public landscape and you end up with these private spaces that are blocking your access, you gotta think, okay, how am I gonna get around that? How am I going to create a, a broader system? So um, there were two things that we did. One, we thought about how a path or a waterfront esplanade doesn't always have to be next to the water. You know, it, We could be creating a whole zone um, 
of sort of, of, of park space and that there's a pathway that, goes, that sort of knits back and forth into the city and helps to connect you with um, existing open spaces and existing um, amenities within the, the neighborhood. We also went and talked to city planning. They were about to do a rezoning. And um, there are actually two colors here. There, there's a, um, a color for a 20-foot wide esplanade and a color for a 40-foot wide esplanade. And we convinced city planning that they, based on this diagram, that, that a 20-foot esplanade just wasn't big enough and that we needed 40 feet. And so as part of the rezoning for the whole Gowanus area, they actually increased the setback for all future development to 40 feet. So it was just like a really simple diagram and a really clear presentation just saying, well, you know, the Gowanus area is fairly open and it's a beautiful area because it's open and has this relationship to the water. And you can have so much more space, so much more recreational space for people. So, you know, think to the future and make it bigger. So we, we won that one. Um, but there are these conflicting sites of private ownership and really we resolved that with this, this um, sort of varied pathway. Um, so looking at, at a phased proposal, what we first um, suggested was that our work or this idea, this notion of the sponge park could be done by a lot of different designers and that it could be integrated into existing development projects. This is a project being done um, by, uh, by actually Rogers Marvel and, um, and we talked to them about integrating those principles. This is a project that was then being done by Toll Brothers and Lee Weintraub was the landscape architect and we met with him and he said, sure. You know, give me your plants, give me your plant, you know, give me your design, sure. And, uh, you know, he'll, he would do the formal, uh, formal uh, um, design of it, but he, he liked it conceptually. So he was going to build that in. That, you know, all of the development in the area, though, has, um, has since kind of died um, or at least slowed um, because the, uh, the area was designated a, um, a super fund, um, which added another sort of added or added a, an interesting wrinkle um, to to the project um, so what that meant was a lot of these development projects that were happening stopped um, but that didn't really stop us um, we kept going and um, and we have managed to um, to just maintain a lot of interest in the in the project um, and part of our I'm just going to skip no, I'm not going to skip these. Um, so part of the, the, the way that we've managed to maintain that momentum is that people want, want uh, the program that's in here. They want, they want to have the street and sponge parks. They imagine these community gardens, these dog parks, these neighborhood garden centers. Um, they're imagining this esplanade. You know, they've bought into the whole idea of, of this um, post-industrial waterfront that has the character of, of, um, of the industrial uh, neighborhood but made to um, work for them now so the uh, the technology is killing me so looking at the the site sections um, you can see how these um, these sponge streets would absorb the water going down to the canal one of the things that we're trying to do is like make make almost an urban condition with the landscape create a space that can be environmentally productive while also being um, ecologically productive. So you have a wetland space with, walklands, with walkways over it. You have um, cafe spaces next to the waterfront. You have places where you can have a different relationship um, to that water's edge. And here, looking at how that would, would look in terms of the, the layout of the planting strategy. So one of the things that, that um, you have to face when you work uh, in the city is that it's incredibly jurisdictionally, jurisdictionally I guess that is the word, um, complicated. Um, the Department of Parks uh, controls the street trees. The DOT is controlling the streets. The DEP is controlling the water. Um, the Department of Environmental Conservation has the first five feet of soil. Um, the, uh, the canal sediments actually belong to the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and, uh, and then the upland, uh, well, then uh, the, let's see. What did I forget? The shade over the water is the Department of Environmental Conservation. And you really can't, and that's state, um, and you really can't do much without going through the DEC on, on all of these um, issues. But then to add to that, we also then had um, the site become a super fund, which um, meant that we brought in another level of, of regulation on top of everything. But 
but but um, somehow we've managed to to smooth things over with everybody, and I think part of the process was going to probably a hundred cocktail parties. I hate to say, it, but and just having individual conversations with each of the people in charge of this, so that they really felt that that they could buy into it. And because I had an individual conversation with someone, they could understand why it was a good idea and why we were doing the right thing. And I mean, it wasn't that it had to be a cocktail party. It was just that, that I had these individual conversations and small, small group presentations. And it took a huge amount of time. But, but it's, it's had a lasting impact. And, and the great thing is that it's meant that we've gotten support, um, support letters to, to find additional funding. So here's a view of, of the Street End Park, um, or one of the Street End Parks, um, this is the termination. When we went to the initial public meeting, um, the, the boat club um, sort of freaked out because we had a railing down here at the Street End, and they said, we're not gonna be able to get out of the water if you have a railing there. And I'm thinking, but the four-year-old's gonna fall in. So the nice thing about a master plan is that you can sort of suggest a large idea, and a lot of those, you know, very important details are going to have to get worked out as we develop um, the individual solutions. Um, so here um, you can see how there's a, a boardwalk edge and a green edge, and, and here we did do the railing. Um, we have a, a, a wetland um, in one of the turning basins here, a remediation wetland, um, and here is a view north. Um, and um, one of the, the, um, the great things that's happened is that um, we got tremendous support from our congresswoman, um, Nydia Velasquez, and actually Nydia's um, husband proposed to her on the canal, so we, we, we made this rendering for Nydia. Um, and um, and it's, it's great because um, ultimately she managed to get a, about a million dollar appropriation from the federal government um, from the Department of Interior, and she was thrilled because it was her first Department of Interior grant. Um, she hadn't been able to actually get funding from them before, but but, um, because this project dealt with sewage, um, then uh, it was like a new sort of funding stream that was available to her um, because the Department of Interior doesn't have a whole lot of, of money. Um, so anyway, so what I want to just briefly talk about now is that, that the momentum um, behind the master plan has actually helped us now uh, get a New England Water Pollution Control Commission grant. So. Um, we, we brought in all this funding for the development of a first pilot, um, for the construction money for a first pilot, um, but it wasn't going to pay for the design. So we went out and we found outside funding to pay for our design work. And that's something that I think is a slightly different business model than what most firms do, and so I wanted to raise it because I think it's an opportunity for, for you as students as you're sort of going forth in your practice and for faculty members too. <laughs> um, um, but we, we got a grant to actually develop the first sponge park. So I wanted to show you some of the initial drawings of that. This is the, the site um, at the end of 2nd Street. You saw the water view of this. This is where the dredgers actually um, uh, launched their boats, and the shipping container is right over here. Um, and then, uh, so what we're going to do is actually take the, the storm water from these two blocks and direct it into this, um, this system. Um, the, the sponge park at the street end. What we're doing now is developing it into a modular system so that what we can do is then deploy it in other areas around the city. Um, and so this is very, very early in our, our design thinking, but, um, but we're in the process of developing these, these, these units and trying to figure out how it's all gonna work. Um, so here you can see how that is developing. Um, and how it will look. So that's, that's the first sponge park. And so we, um, we, with this grant, we're actually going to um, work with Montclair State University, and they're going to monitor its efficacy for three years and figure out you know, exactly how much water it's taking and, and what pollutants it's actually the, the, um, the system is taking out of the, out of the water and the soil. So the next um, project I'm going to talk about is BQ, BQ Green uh, Reconnection Strategies for Brownstone Brooklyn. When I first started the firm, I applied for a grant from the New York State Council on the Arts, um, and I studied this area of Cobble Hill and Carroll Gardens um, relating to the BQE. There's a sunken highway trench. Um, again, a Robert Moses project. Um, 
And, uh, and he, Robert Moses, spent a lot of time looking down at it, watching the cranes and derricks and earth-moving machines that looked like toys far below him, moving about in the giant trench being cut through mile after mile of densely packed houses, a big black figure against the sunset in the late afternoon, like a giant gazing down on a giant road he was molding. He had a house, or he had, he had a, an apartment that overlooked the construction of of uh, this project. This is the, the reality of, of the BQE now. Uh, it's a six-lane highway. Um, and you can see in that last image that it, you know, it was painted as this, um, this parkway. And our, our reality was very different. Um, so what he did um, was actually cut through this brownstone neighborhood. All the pink um, indicates the, the buildings um, that were taken down. Um, and here you can see the path that just went right through the middle of the neighborhood. Um, and it's interesting to actually look at how the BQE uh, now relates to, um, or the incidence of high asthma and um, physical obesity um, and poverty relate to the BQE. We're starting to correlate those things. Um, and we are also looking at the physical issues um, adjacent to the BQE along its, its length. Um, there, are some, some, there are some positive adjacencies. A lot of the extra spaces are used for recreational use, um, and some of them are fairly successful. Um, and, um, it, but it is interesting to look at, at sort of two sides of the BQE. This is the, um, the east side, and this is the west side. This is the water side. And the east side, which is more connected to the neighborhood, um, has multi-million dollar homes, and the other side is, is you know, doesn't. Um, <laughs> um, there's also uh, an interesting correlation between gang violence and uh, the BQE that we're looking at, um, particularly for a site that we're now um, examining in Williamsburg, where we have a Dominican community and a Puerto Rican community that have territories on either side. So it's creating a really strong physical line. So the, the two sites that, that um, we're looking at um, have kind of different open space needs. Um, in uh, uh, the Cobble Hill area, there's a need just generally for open space, whereas in our, um, our site in Williamsburg, there are a lot of little pocket parks, but there's really a need for more sort of active recreation for those teens who are susceptible to getting involved with the gang violence. So it's sort of, you know, you, you, you can't really necessarily show causation, but you can start to, to think about how these things might, um, how design interventions might um, help these situations. Um, in communicating to uh, the, the, um, the community, um, we started to break down the issues into this, um, this productive matrix, looking at um, pedestrian circulation and development, health and safety, vehicular circulation, um, recreation and environmental benefit and cost, and trying to assess the sort of relative value of our, our actions. And then we also were looking at ways of diagramming um, the different sort of conditions of the highway along its length. Um, as ways of communicating to, to, um, to the community design, really sort of complex design issues and things they might not think about in terms of the spatial configurations. Um, and then we looked at how um, additional functions might be added to, um, to the, each of those sections. Um, we also uh, looked at the, the sort of productive infrastructure, that there was a potential to, um, even in just adding trees, to get an incredible economic gain. And this was a really important drawing because this drawing actually helped, um, again, Nydia Velasquez um, get a match for, you know, I think it was like a half million, half million dollars that she was bringing into the city. Um, she needed a local match from the DOT. So she used this diagram to actually help get that local match from the DOT because we suggested using US Forest Service data that 350 trees would provide almost a half million dollars worth of pollution control, recycle $300,000 worth of water, and contribute $4 million in shade value for a 10-year gain of almost $50 million. So we basically used this federal stats that were in this incredibly sort of awful, thick, not graphic um, you know, tome, and turned them graphic and turned it into something really useful. So, uh, in looking at our two sites, it's interesting to compare them because city planning is, is very much sort of advocating for the development of this area, which is sort of the rich area, 
um, which has a population of 100,000 and a median household income of 80,000. 80, um, the cost of this project would probably be about a billion dollars to cap it or to cap the area they're talking about or that we were looking at. Um, whereas in our, our Williamsburg um, area, the median income is about half as much and the cost is much lower, um, but our population is much greater. So we feel like it has a better bang for the buck, but we haven't proved that to city planning yet. We're working on that. Um, so and we actually are working on that. We're doing an economic analysis right now. Um, so this is the, the BQ Green in, in, uh, in Williamsburg. <laughs> Um, and you can see that there are a lot of different um, structural conditions that we had to um, face um, uh, uh, along its length. And it's pretty interesting, actually, to, to think about how that impacted the, our strategy because um, there were certain areas where it was quite feasible to deck based on the structural considerations. And then there were other areas where it just wasn't really worth it economically. And also because the highway wasn't built to um, uh, federal highway standards, and so right now there's there's like a scary amount of clearance. Like the I think there's 14 feet of clearance um, for the bridges, the existing bridges, and so um, um, if we're uh, in order to to get um, the the right amount of clearance for our deck, we had to make sure that this um, was was thin enough um, so that we could keep accommodating the traffic underneath. Um, and so that meant that we needed to have this intermediate structure um, along the span. So, so that prioritized where we were working to these um, three blocks. And we thought that a first option could be to plant a green wall. And then a second option was to um, do sort of heavy um, uh, recreational space in the center areas um, with um, more um, uh, real planted areas um, along the edges. Um, the, the, uh, the community felt very strongly that they wanted to have these active recreation spaces. And in a third phase of the project, we um, proposed actually adding, uh, adding a recreation center and daycare center as well. So we figure they can get you know, two blocks of new open space and a recreation center for you know, a, a tenth of the cost of the other project. Um, so this is, uh, this is what the neighborhood looks like now. And then this was with the, uh, with the deck over it. Um, and then this is a, a passive park now that's really passive because no one uses it except junkies and, and um, homeless people. And so we turned that into a barbecue space. Um, and these are all based on, on uh, a, a number of um, community meetings that we had. We actually went out to the playgrounds and, um, and polled people. This is a minimally used um, uh, handball court, and we want to transform that into this um, new community center and, and pool. So this is the BQ Green in Cobble Hill. Um, there's a little bit more detail on that. Um, and here you can, oops, sorry, here we go back to the, the productive matrix and thinking about the, the existing conditions. Um, and now how if we added just merely a, a green wall along um, along the edge, it would improve the air quality and decrease noise pollution. Um, you can see this is the existing condition and then the proposed. Um, in, uh, in this situation, we would, basically our, our wheel is, is filling out and you can see what that section would look like. Um, in a, a second phase, we'd improve the pedestrian network, improve air quality, decrease noise pollution and enhance the ecological potential. Um, and here's the before and the after. These drawings were also very effective in getting that local match um, from, from uh, the DOT. And here is the, the, um, the decked condition, and this is the, clearly the really expensive um, proposal. But here you can see that, that the, the wheel is much more filled out and that it doesn't just favor the, the car anymore. Um, and the results are that there's an improved pedestrian network, improved air quality, decreased noise pollution, expanded recreational opportunities, greater development opportunity, improved transportation access, reestablishment of neighborhood connectivity, and enhanced ecological potential. And what we've done is kind of a hybrid Jane Jacobs and um, Robert Moses uh, proposal here, where um, I'm not proposing that these, these um, development, that there be development in the park, but what I was thinking is that there be a, an upzoned area right on the corners um, 
relating to the relating to the pedestrian crossings on the park and the and the uh, and some of the automotive crossings on the park. So here's the before, and this is the after. Brooklyn gone Paris. Brooklyn turned into Paris. So now the, the last project that I'm going to talk about is um, is a proposal um, that uh, we uh, I did with Architectural Research Office um, for the Museum of Modern Art. Um, it's called a, um, a New Urban Ground, and it's a proposal um, relating to sea level rise in, and climate change in New York Harbor. Um, this is the exhibition at MoMA. I don't know, hopefully some of you got to see it um, last year. Um, it was up for a long time, it seemed like. Um, but it's, um, there, were, uh, there were five teams um, that were, um, were chosen to look at, at uh, climate change issues in the harbor. And um, our team looked at, um, at Lower Manhattan. Um, if you uh, consider uh, the rapid sea level uh, projections, um, this, this uh, map is, shows the, the impacts that uh, would be felt by, by New York City. Actually, um, uh, the student who had the site in Red Hook, um, you should probably be thinking about that. Um, <laughs> That issue um, in relation to your site because it's underwater, um, but but it's pretty interesting to look at Lower Manhattan and the impacts that it's going to have on on that area. Um, actually, there was a we um, as I said, there were five teams that were chosen. It was um, uh, Aero, uh, Scape, uh, uh, N Architects, Matthew Baird, and um, and LTL um, were all working out at PS1 um, in a kind of charrette situation, kind of like your studios here. Um, on, on this problem for about 10 weeks, what we produced. Um, so this is our site in, in Lower Manhattan. Um, and uh, it, one thing I want to state here is that Manhattan is an island, and it's something that's really easy to forget sometimes when you're on it or in it. Um, but if it's interesting to think about the edge morphology of Manhattan um, in 1650 and how different it is from um, from the current condition, but you can see the the bathymetry, and that's a kind of word that I want to define because I a lot of people don't know it. Um, the bathymetry is the underwater topography, so the bathymetry of the sort of shelf of the channel is out in this zone. So you can see um, how different the edge was. This was um, probably a series of tidal flats, um, much uh, much like. Um, this edge, which you saw in the beginning of the presentation, right? Oh, actually, and there's one other thing I want to point out here, that this Vile map um, is a hydrologic map of New York City. And again, you can start to correlate, hopefully, from what you just saw, the relationship between these former wetlands and that future inundation. Um, as as uh, Manhattan grew, um, there was increasing fill. And you can see how the island was shaped in relation to um, the, the, the need for trade. Um, and Exchange Place actually happened at the place where exchange happened, right? Wall Street and Exchange Place um, happened at one of these slips, right? So there was this increasing hardening of the edge, and this is the sort of typical bulkhead condition. Um, but by 1960, um, we ended up with a different kind of configuration where you had bigger ships that were coming in and they were offloading onto these finger piers. And the finger piers actually related to the internal street configurations. Right? So, but then, again, by 2010, we sort of filled it all in again. Um, and a lot of the finger piers went away. Um, and we filled out to that line where the bathymetry really drops off. Right? So, it's, uh, it's interesting now to think about the impact of this six-foot sea level rise and the 18-foot um, Category 2 storm surge and how that relates to the existing, um, existing fabric and what really what the value at risk is. Um, this is an image that was done by one of my students uh, or by a, a group of my students at Harvard now um, mapping what happened in the 1938 hurricane. That was the last time this happened. So this, it's not like this is some great, you know, uh, 
sort of mythical um, projection. It's actually already happened um, and will happen again, so we really need to plan for it. So the other issue that we have, though, is um, like Gowanus, um, we have a combined sewer system. And these are all the outflow locations um, that surround um, our site. So we came up with the idea that we'd have a water in, water out. We have a fresh water input from the sky, from rain, rainfall, and from um, stormwater. And then we have salt water inputs coming from, from the edge. So again, you know, looking at this jurisdictions, you know, the, the, we got a lot of interest from, from a number of public agencies because they realized that their, their, this whole area is going to impact them greatly or the inundations of this area would impact them greatly. But we have, um, I think the greatest uh, impact is going to be really on the state land um, at the perimeter, which is kind of interesting. Um, but the city really has the greater risk from the storm, um, the storm surge and the combined sewer overflows. So it's sort of interesting how that breaks down. Um, so we came up with a system. It's a two-part system. There's an upland system and an edge system. Um, the upland system is a series of, um, of streets that are absorbent. And then the edge actually combines um, freshwater wetlands and salt marshes. So here, breaking down the upland system, we had a series of porous streets, we had a series of collector streets, and then we had a streets that could take the water if there was a big flood. So looking at how those upland streets would be designed, um, it actually took all of the infrastructure elements that are currently in the street bed and put them into waterproof uh, vaults underneath the sidewalk. My thought was that you could have access um, hatches within the within the sidewalk um, so that when the infrastructure became obsolete or broke, you could just lift up the hatch instead of having to rip open your street every six months or you know, that's what it seems like in New York. But then take that over that whole street bed as a permeable ground, right? And, and um, the way we divided it up is that we had the public or the private infrastructure, the dry infrastructure in one set of vaults and the public infrastructure, which is really the wet infrastructure in another set of vaults. Um, the notion was that, that the parking areas would be taken over by more green space and that um, there would be space for deliveries, but this would be a kind of new green paving system. So this is one of the, the, uh, the sort of conduits that would take more water more quickly. Um, and then we had these kind of hybrid systems that would take a lot of water really quickly um, out of the city. And then we're also proposing or imagining some kind of new um, light rail system that could exist around the, the city to provide greater transportation connectivity. So if you look at this new, um, new hardened edge, we, uh, we imagine sort of raising the ground um, around uh, Manhattan to this new six foot level. Um, and then creating a series of new um, waterfront parks. These are upland parks that could um, help to provide more recreational space for the city. Um, and then a series of, of uh, freshwater wetlands that would exist sort of outbound of that. And then a series of salt marshes um, um, on the perimeter and also um, these uh, uh, battery breakwaters along the edge. So here you can see a vision of our new vision of the city. Now we, we you know, we're proposing uh, an image of, of New York for 90 years from now. Um, so we showed new development spaces in the slightly darker gray. We imagined that there would be um, this, this pattern, this uh, sort of, uh, I think we called it a crenellation that could continue all the way up the edge of Manhattan. It's sort of the, the, the next pattern um, to imagine. But it's a pattern that sort of equally weighs the ecological and the development. So we're not saying, oh, it's all going to be green, fuzzy, you know, edge. It's going to be, you know, money-making, big, architecture and urban development and, and you know, this other system that's going to help with, um, with the sea level rise issues. So here, looking at some details of, of how that would work, um, here's a, um, a section showing how the, um, this sort of series of wetlands um, would work and, and upland spaces um, with these transverse paths going across as well. Um, this is the urban estuary at Northmore Street. Um, and here is a, a section of what that would look like at Battery Park City. And you can see there's sort of this rough edge and then 
the bathymetry drops off really dramatically. We couldn't really push out any further. I mean, it was a pretty bold move, sort of cutting into the island at Battery Park City, particularly when we were presenting to Amanda Burden, who had been involved in the de design of that whole thing. But, but you can't really go out any further, because anything that you do is going to get washed away um, by the currents of the Hudson. So here, looking at a situation a little bit further down, um, down the edge. Um, here, we're maintaining um, active boating space and then creating a, a little harbor. Um, we cut, we allowed the, the sort of wetland landscape or this soft landscape to come through the city. So there'd be bridges that go across that. So you're really experiencing the landscape in the city in a very different way. Um, and then here at the Battery Breakwater, um, oops, went too fast. Um, we had a series of, of geotextile um, sacks filled with dredge material from, from the harbor um, that would be placed in the shallows um, outside of the, the battery. Just the word battery. Um, and you can see how that would, would look initially. And the idea was that we'd create a geometric form that would morph over time with sedimentation patterns and tidal fluctuations um, and coming into and out of the site. And the nice thing is that this creates um, a, seri uh, a series of little uh, emergent wetlands that, that are and islands that you can kayak through. So sometimes you'll be able to walk on them and sometimes you won't. Um, so here, moving around um, the, edge, the edge to the East River, have an interesting condition of the, the, the thymetry is much more shallow, so it's much easier to, to make these wetland um, conditions with these paths that go over. Um, but we also had what we described as the, um, the East River Esker. Um, we created a berm space um, that, um, I don't know if you know the origins of the word Esker. It's actually a Gaelic term um, that means path. And it's, a, um, it's uh, the, an Esker is a geologic formation that was a, a kind of curvy um, snake-like formation um, that was formed from the ret retreating glaciers. So it's a, it's a form that's very common in the area. And so we thought we would use that, that term um, for this new urban esker, this edge condition that has this berm in it. And on the inside of that berm, we thought about another um, typology that exists in the area of the, uh, uh, the sunken forests of Fire Island. So we had a high space and then a low space with the idea that the, the trees on the upland or the, the, you know, the urban side would grow up to the height of the top of the urban esker. So you get a really interesting sort of sectional condition. But the reason for it um, was to have uh, space to collect all the slosh from, um, from one of these storm surge events. So this is actually one of the historic slips that would be used to drain um, both the CSOs and these periodic inundations. Um, down into that sunken forest. And the trees that were planted in this area um, were uh, trees that can withstand periodic, well, inundation from salt spray and salt water. Um, so, and then here you have it. This is the, uh, our, our vision for what the, the city would, would look like ultimately um, in the future. It's really a complete kind of reimagining of your experience of an urban condition. And it's such an incredible sort of, sort of, uh, contrast between the sort of sublime canyons of, of Lower Manhattan and Wall Street and this kind of other natural um, landscape. So, well, natural artificial landscape. Um, so that's, um, that was the, the, the end of my um, projects. But I wanted to just talk about one more thing, if I have like five more minutes. Um, because what, what happened after, um, after MoMA was that we thought, well, huh, maybe, maybe there's an opportunity to think about um, how these traditional methods of, of keeping water out of cities um, or, or even how um, urban design relates to, to landscape uh, uh, infrastructures might be rethought. So we started looking at it on a, a sort of global level of breaking apart sort of the seawall and combined sewer overflows and the channelization of, of stormwater and seeing, you know, sort of looking at, at the, the problems of, of that um, on a more global level. And then looking for typologies 
um, that exist in sort of certain latitudes. So thinking about where the opportunities for using reef ecologies might be. Because, you know, in our New York solution, we were really looking at, at sort of a very typical sort of East Coast wetland, um, wetland scenario. So we're thinking, well, what do you do in other cities around the world? So we looked at these reef ecologies. Um, we looked at, at mangrove ecologies and where those could be used and sort of the physical structure of those um, of those uh, know, systems. Um, and then also maritime forest ecologies, which we had discussed a little bit, although this is a pretty dramatic uh, version of one and where those exist. Um, and then also, you know, the, the marsh ecologies um, that I mentioned before um, and thinking about um, also their, uh, their sort of economic potential. So we, we looked at what the storm impacts would be in Miami and Shanghai and Karachi and New York and Cairo. And these are the relative elevations um, of those cities in relation to storms. And it's pretty interesting to think about, think about sort of, you know, Miami is, is really hit by the brunt of, of um, you know, category one through five storms all the time. Shanghai, you know, if you get a category five storm, it has a big impact. Karachi, um, you know, a, a, it takes a big storm to have that impact. Um, and New York, certainly we need to have a, a fairly big storm to have an impact. But it's, but it's also interesting to think about Cairo because you have a population of 34 million people and an area of 22,000 um, square kilometers with a gross domestic product of $150 billion and a, a GDP per capita of um, $3,900. Uh, but, but really, if, if, if this area were flooded, this actually indicates the flooded area, what you lose is all of this agricultural space. So you lose a lot of the economic engine for the, the city and for the region. So that's something to consider, um, clearly. Um, in Miami, you have different uh, different issues. You have again a, a you know population of, of 5.4 million and an area of uh, uh, 15,000 roughly square kilometers and a GDP of um, 292 billion. So really, what we're trying to do is like equate them and think about them in relation to one another. But here you can see um, what the inundation would do to Miami, and in this case, um, it's more of a physical impact. You know, it's a direct damage um, to, to the city. And then in Karachi, you have a different issue. You have a population of 18 million people um, and an area of, um, of 3,500 kilometers and a GDP of 78 billion and a gross to uh, a GDP per capita of uh, $2,600. But here you can see there, it's just an incredibly dense, um, densely populated area, but it's not you know, it's not like there's a way to sort of get out of there. And, and so you're going to have just tremendous impact on the people. So we've got agriculture, physical property, and here, community, people. And then in Shanghai, um, here we have a population of 19.2 of million um, and an area of, of uh, let's say, 2,700 um, square kilometers with a GDP of 233 billion. And here, again, you can see um, the, the inundation levels are very high. Um, and here we're proposing that, you know, there is a potential to create this, this new infrastructure to help to, um, to ameliorate some of these, uh, these impacts. So, so this is just the beginning of sort of another level of, of research that we've been looking at um, and thinking about um, really, you know, what can we do about global climate change. Um, and, uh, you know, clearly it's an issue that, that needs to be addressed. And so we want to think about ways that we can think about sort of short term solutions um, for making our cities more environmentally productive and ecologically productive, um, but also sort of larger, longer term, sort of bigger picture kinds of, of scenarios of how we might redesign cities, um, particularly waterfront cities. So, thank you. Are there, are there questions? I won't. No.
What's funny when I, I gave a talk at, at Middlebury and I, I they don't have an architecture pro, they don't have like a formal architecture program and, and I so I was trying to like say it's okay it's okay that you don't have an architecture program you can still be architects right um, and so one of the things that I said was that that you know part of my practice has sort of evolved out of out of my interests and so um, and my relationships with people and my desire to just, I, I, I love working across scales. Um, so, so when I started the practice, I knew that I wanted to do infrastructure projects, like urban infrastructure projects, and I knew I wanted to do campus work. And I also knew that I actually enjoyed residential work, but it was something that I have to say, as I felt like it was sort of expected that, that I would be doing residential work somehow. Um, going off on my own. I think there's, there, I, I don't know whether I just, I had a, a issues with being a mom, like I have three kids, and I was like, if I have an issue with being a mom, like people expect me to be going and doing people's gardens and people's houses, and you know, because I have lots of friends who are moms who are building houses, whatever. So, so I think I, I sort of tried to kind of sublimate the, um, the residential practice a little bit, but the residential practice was a huge engine for the office. Um, it was probably about a third of the practice, and I still love doing residential work. But I did have this sort of other vision of what I wanted to do on a larger scale of doing these infrastructure projects, and so I applied for, and the campus project, so I applied for grants from the New York State Council on the Arts and um, the James Marston Fitch Foundation. And what that did was it, it helped give me the seed money um, to start to do the, that research that would build the portfolio. So instead of going after design competitions where I was competing with 5,000 incredibly talented designers, I went after the grant where there's less competition. Or, and if you can write really well, then you, you know, and you can frame an argument really simply, um, you, you can probably get a lot of support for your idea. But I think part of that is just like coming up with an idea, something that you really believe in, and then framing it, and then you know writing a proposal for it. And I've, you know, I I did this for a long time before I actually was able to make it work. You know, I can't say that I sort of got the first grant that I applied for. I, you know, it took a, a number of years to actually um, figure out that formula, really, of like stripping off all the jargon and making it really clear. Um, but. Um, but those two seed grants actually then led to bigger grants, and it's become kind of a different model for my practice. So that that um, you know the 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 initial NISCA grant led to another NISCA grant, which then led to this um, this uh, funding from city council, and you know the the. Um, the grant, another, an, another, um, or I guess the, the Fitch grant has led to, you know, other grants for larger projects, and because the, I guess the Fitch grant led to getting the Graham Foundation grant. So it's been a nested sort of, um, or a, a snowballing kind of situation. Um, but the residential work is actually incredibly helpful because um, it it helped me kind of define what I was interested in on a formal level. And think about sort of um, sort of strategies um, for building, also. And t I can test a lot of ideas. Um, and it's it's funny because re very recently I've been working on this garden in Brooklyn Heights, and it's I built this like core ten steel wall on one facade, and I've never worked with core ten before. And and um, you know the it, it arrives and it's it's raw and the client freaks out because it's not like the pretty sample that I showed her that's all rusty and nice and she's like well how long is it going to bleed and I'm thinking I have no idea so you know we do all the research and we figure it out but it's really nice to figure it out there and not when you're doing the high line like we went out and we looked at the high line. And, and I called the, the, one of the people that was working on the construction of it because they have this white concrete and this, these beautiful cortend fe fences and planters that actually hang over the white cortend. I said, well, what do they do about that? And she said, oh, it's a design flaw. It's like, oh, shit. You know, it's the high line, right? It's beautiful. They power wash it three times a day. <laughs> 
So I thought, OK, great to figure all those things out on a micro level before you go and do the, the huge scale project. Um, so that you can then avoid some of these sort of larger ongoing maintenance issues in the long run. So you make more sustainable design. So, you know, I, I actually, it, it's, it's pretty, um, I don't know, it's, it's just, it's nice to sort of realize that it all, there's a purpose for all of the things that we do and there's a reason that we call it design practice, right? <laughs> so, Long-winded answer, sorry. <laughs> Yes. Sorry, just a quick question. I'll bark it out if that's okay. Please. Well, you know, it's a, it's a good question. We're starting to, um, well, we're trying to get New York City even to take on some of these issues um, as, as precedent. One of the things that I've been doing with that, that um, um, Sponge Park project is trying to make a module that can then be prototyped and, or can be reproduced and deployed in a lot of different situations. And so I'm, I'm in the process of patenting the module because I can see how the module could relate to, say, like the highway system. And we got another grant from the Department of Environmental Protection through an EPA Clean Water Act filing. Um, and I think we finally got the contract signed. That's in, anyway. Um, but, um, but that is related to the scuppers that come off the highway and all the water that goes into direct drainage. And so we're looking at making this system that can then, you know, go everywhere. So that's like one way. But we, we started to look into UN procurement um, uh, procedures and uh, it just, it's, it's so complicated. And we're trying, you know, we'll, we'll do it. But I, when I went to some meetings about it, they said, yeah, it'll probably take you, you know, five or ten years. <laughs> okay. You know, it's a long process, but so we'll start and we'll do it and, you know, we'll see where it goes. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge um, starting to get into these um, or trying to get into some of those more global markets. But, and my firm's only six years old, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get it out there. <laughs> yes. We're really small. You know, I have anywhere between eight and 12 people, and we're in this tiny studio. And I think part of the reason that it works really well is because we're in this tiny studio and everybody knows what's going on with everybody else's projects. And so people will hear things and they'll sort of cross pollinate a lot all the time. It makes it a little hard to get work done efficiently sometimes. Um, but when we have things to do, we, we manage to somehow make that work. Um, but I. I just kind of, I, I look for people that I think will mesh well with each other because in a small office it's almost like, it's like a family, you know, it's like a marriage almost because everybody really has to get along um, and they have to be able to work really well together and they have to communicate but they also have, I want everybody to have different skills so I kind of look for some unique skill set from each person so that in a way they're sort of the, they're the specialists but they're also just really good generalists um, and uh, you know they can, because we're all working so closely together you can get an architect that actually might know something about landscape or you can get a, a landscape architect that might know something about architecture, you know we're sort of, it's a, it's a blending and the sculptor is fabulous, she knows everything about everything, She's, she was an architect undergrad so, um, but she really knows materials. Like she knows about welding steel and connections. And it's really great. So, but it is really tiny. I, I don't know how, I don't know. That's the next challenge is figuring out how to grow and figuring out how to make it a, a sort of probably a better business. You know, design is such a great profession, but it's really challenging business. <laughs> Especially when you want to do really interesting things. So. Oh, thanks. Thank